Beautiful. Well done. Thank you, Stella. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this passage that we have brought, that you've brought before us this morning. And Father, we pray as we engage with that there to be with this preacher and with the rest of us as we as we listen and understand it. So we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As a child, who would you go to when trouble was close by? For some, they might hide underneath their bed. Uh, for others, it would be seeking the safety and security and the wisdom of mum. And today is Mother's Day. And so we remember and celebrate our mums in a very, spe in a very special way because they have a very special place in our hearts. And similarly, for those that are mums, you have often have the privilege of being that person, that place of security and safety, particularly when life is full of trouble for, for your children, no matter their age. In our passage from John this morning, there was trouble brewing. Trouble was brewing. And trouble was brewing for, for the disciples. And Jesus was going to take this time to speak words of assurance bef uh, before the crisis unfolded before them or engulfed them. And the context for, for this was, it begins with verse 31, that and after he had left the room, the he is Judas Iscariot. It was... It was the ones who, it was the disciples, it was the, it was the apostles who Jesus was now going to spend the next period of time with. And from, from chapters 13, 31 to chapter 17, there's, there's this intensity, there's this intensity, insight and influence of, of, of this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. So that the disciples will be assured during their time of trouble. So we look at it in three ways. It's living in troubled times. It's love expressed in troubled times. And it's landmarks through troubled times. Living in troubled times. Uh, when trouble surrounds us in our lives, Often we just need to hear that it's going to end well. That's all we need to know. It might be painful and extraordinarily difficult, but as long as we know it's going to end well, that's the hope that we have, isn't it? That's we, we, we say, well, I think I can deal with this. It can be in times of sickness, separation, or senseless harmful actions. Trouble seems to surround us. It's at the front and the back door. It's at the windows. We're, we're surrounded by it. We're engulfed with it. We feel captured. And there's an overwhelming sense of fear. It's at those times that Jesus speaks into our lives. And the voice of Jesus is heard through the hum of growing fears. And what was the growing fears of the disciples? Well, there was two. One was... One was abandonment, and the other one, the other one was apprehension. Just think about abandonment. It seems strange to talk about abandonment on Mother's Day, doesn't it? But there is a sick feeling that creeps over you when you realise that you're going to be abandoned. The thought of being left high and dry, and for some people, it's the once again, I've been left high and dry. This is not a first time for them. It's an experience that many children find themselves in. It is a thought process that, that the disciple Peter was beginning to feel. Jesus had said in the upper room, had he not? My children, I will be with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I now tell you where I am going you cannot come. For the past three years, wherever Jesus went, the disciples went. Now he's saying, where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm going to... 
abandon you? He doesn't use that word. But Jesus was addressing the disciples as children who could not understand what was to happen next. He was preparing them for that he was going to leave them. And in leaving them, what Jesus was going to do, they were not to follow. And the disciples would not be able to follow Jesus in his crucifixion, in his ascension, in his resurrection and the session with the Father. He would go back being in the presence of the Father. They were not to follow yet. Yet. Out of strength and curiosity, though, Peter, we all know about Peter. We all love Peter, don't we? Peter challenges Jesus, uh, first with a question, then a very bold statement. And the question is, verse 36, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Well, that's good to know. Uh, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. The challenge was about how they would be abandoned and how Peter would be better than the rest of them. And his bold promise, his bold promise was, I will even lay down my life with you. I don't know about the other, the other ten or whoever's in this room. I will lay down my life with you. I'm going to go with you. You're not going to abandon me. He would follow Jesus to the bitter end, if that were possible. Yet it was Jesus who gave the rebuke, a loving rebuke. Let us understand this, that despite the best of intentions, we heard of those words before, if it was not my intention to do this, or whatever it was, plead someone. That despite the best of his intentions, Peter would in fact deny Jesus three times. This was not a way to preempt Peter's choices. Far from it. Rather, it was Jesus knowing Peter and knowing his failures. Jesus could have said nothing. Just, okay, well, you've said this, that's very good, and not say anything. But Jesus took it upon him to speak about Peter's failures. But then Peter's response would have taken everyone by surprise if Jesus hadn't said anything. Rather, Jesus spoke truth. And by speaking the truth, prepared Peter for his own actions. His own actions. Peter wouldn't have had it. The, it was the furthest thing from his mind in that room that he would ever deny Jesus. Yet not a few hours later on, and he would do it three times. Jesus was preparing Peter's heart for Peter's own actions. And I was struck as I read this passage many times through. From the end of chapter 13 going into 14, it is one conversation from Jesus. We have a chapter division, don't we? <laughs> we have a chapter division. We, we, we get to the end of chapter 13. Oh, that was the end of chapter 13. Now we're up to chapter 13. Let not your hearts be troubled. Oh, that is such a great way to start a conversation. But it's only part way through a conversation, isn't it? It is one conversation from Jesus. There is a chapter division that often forces us to start at 14 verse 1. And this follows immediately with um, after Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. Friends, can I say we can draw great strength from this? You see, Jesus told Peter that he would deny. And in denying, it was going to have a massive impact for Peter himself and for the other disciples. They, they all speak about it. All of the Gospels speak about this. Jesus speaks of... Do not let your hearts be troubled because he's speaking to Peter saying, trouble's going to engulf you, but don't let trouble <coughs> overwhelm you. 
Don't let your trouble overwhelm you. It's not going to be Peter's future. Trouble is not going to be Peter's future. This, this, this denying of Jesus three times is not going to be where it, where, where it starts and ends for you. There's going to be more. There's going to be more that's going to happen for this. And in fact, in John chapter 17, Jesus prays that none will be lost, including Peter. Friends, can I say that there will be days when our actions will cause trouble and we will despise our lives and we will de despair our futures. It is in those days that trouble surrounds us. It is in those days that we must believe that Jesus holds us in the palm of his hand, that he treasures us close to his heart. He is the great high priest who, when you look at the high priest vestments, where were the, where the vestments put? Where were the 12 tribes on the heart of the great high priest, on the heart of the high priest? So where does, where does Jesus hold us? Close to his heart, in the palm of his hand. We must understand that, that while we will do actions which we will did be, uh, cause despise our lives and despair our futures, Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus intercedes for you. None will be lost. Trouble is all around, but don't let trouble consume your heart. Don't let trouble consume your heart. Much later, Peter repented and confessed his failure and was restored by Christ. Three times Jesus asked if Peter loved him three times for every denial and three times Peter responded with yes you know I do Jesus then sent Peter to feed the believers of Christ who are the church and friends can I say that today we continue to feed the believers of Christ with the words of God that brings assurance and comfort to those in need and can I say that every one of us needs these words, including this preacher. We will fail. But Christ has told us we will. And we must repent and confess our failures and let Christ restore you graciously. Let Christ restore you graciously. Let him do that work. We need to do our work. So there was abandonment and there was apprehension. And another form of trouble, apprehension was brewing in the heart of Thomas. He too felt that he needed to know more of where Jesus was going to. And Thomas asked this famous question. Thomas said to him, Lord, in verse 5 of chapter 14, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? To which Jesus replied in a very equally well-known passage. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Apprehension is when we're not very sure of what the future holds for us. So Jesus speaks words of assurance that just as they have trusted and followed him uh, for the past three years, so now trust me to know that uh, the way to the Father. Indeed, this has been a very important testimony. For just as Jesus Christ is God with us, Emmanuel, so Jesus Christ is the Father revealed to us in the flesh. If you want to know what God the Father is like, then we have a full and complete picture through how Jesus, the Son of God, lived and dwelt with us. Jesus' view on a range of topics is, it, is the same, it is the exact same as the Father. 
There is no divergence between the Son and the Father. There has been a view, and it's still held by some today, that the, that the Old Testament is all about the age of the Father. Then the New Testament is, is about the age of the Son. And, the, and, the, and this current age is, is the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Divisions are driven between each, uh, between each age or mode, trying to place a distance between the Trinity, between the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. But what Jesus says here, though, is that the Father and the Son are one. What the Father says, the Son says. There is no division. There is no difference between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are the three persons of the Trinity. There is no division. You know, Hebrews 1 opens with that the Son is the, is, is the exact representation of the Father. No prophet, angel or spiritual being ever gets close to being like the Father. So there's only one way to the Father. And it is not through following a series of laws to see if you are good enough. It is simply putting your trust in Jesus Christ who has kept all the laws perfectly. Therefore, what Christ has done is transferred to us when we put our trust in Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus, we trust that Christ is the way to the Father, for Christ is the light of the Father, and he gives life to all from the Father. Friends, trouble may be on your hearts, but there is always a way through troubled times and it is faith in Christ and Christ alone. So that was living through troubled times but then Jesus also knows that his, his disciples are going to be in difficult places in troubled times so how do we love? How do we love through troubled times? Well Jesus gives the answer in verse 34 of 1334, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Can I say that Jesus raised the standard of love by adding, as I have loved you? This was new. In the Old Testament, we certainly know about love and 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 you know to love your neighbor and to love and to and and to love those um, to love the refugee and and to love God we know about that these they were they were existing commandments in the old testament but what was new is the phrase that Jesus brings the son of god brings as uh, you are to love as I have loved you. It is a love that originates in the sacrificial love of Christ. It's not about obeying a law. It's about sacrifice. The new commandment that Jesus gave is a love based on sacrifice. Believers are to follow this, this feature or this principle of love. Since Jesus was to, about to leave them physically, they would need a strong commitment to each other in his absence, especially in times of trouble that were to come. So Jesus is both instructing the disciples then and disciples us today of the importance of this new love, a love based on the sacrificial love of Christ. We are to emulate the example of Christ. It is a mark of being a Christian. It defines genuine Christianity. We started the service looking at looking at these women who went to Korea. It is out of love for love for women and and training and 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 uh, the love of Christ that that. Um, that Margaret Bell and Daisy 
gave themselves, sacrificed, gave tremendously of themselves and set themselves aside to love others because God loved the women of Korea. So they loved the women of Korea. We see constantly of, of appeals to, to this, that and something else. Uh, Ukraine, where, where there are pastors who are, who are going and driving through, uh, going into butcher and, and seeing the devastation that is there. And they give of themselves sacrificially. It's a mark of being a Christian. It defines genuine Christianity. It is troubled times, but it's love in troubled times. This is how you love as I have loved you. And may this continue to be a key feature of this church here in Mount Evelyn that we love because Christ showed us how to love. And through our troubled times, we're going to come across landmarks that we go, how do we, how do we love? What, what landmarks do we, do we look for? How do we, how, how do we get through these times? What, what do I look for? What landmarks should we look for as we journey as a Christian through troubled times? John Bunyan, in his classic work, Pilgrim's Progress, traces the way that Christian, that's, that's the main character, Christian goes from the city of destruction to the, to the celestial city. His, his companions along the way are Mr. Valiant for Truth and Mr. Greatheart. Uh, he encounters other characters, people like the Sloth of Despond, Vanity Fair, and Giant Despair. It's a road trip that stands for the journey that we all take through life. And Bunyan's vivid imagery, powerful imagination, and spiritual insight have helped millions of Christians through the ages. For the Christian, that's for us. We have the way. The way is Jesus. We are to follow him, even though there are many distractions along the way. And Bunyan, John Bunyan, is wise to advise of the disaster of little distractions that, people, that believers find themselves in. Places like morality or the city of coveting. And this can distract believers for years. They can go into those places and go round and round and round all the time wondering what are we doing and getting all champed up at all sorts of different things which have no significance for going to the city going to the celestial city it's a distraction for the christian jesus is the truth and jesus is the truth about god the father and there is no need to be distracted by going to doubting castle no point going to Doubting Castle because you'll get locked up there in doubts. And it's where many people along the way find themselves. And for the Christian, Jesus is the life. For in Christ, every believer of, of Christ has life eternal. Bunyan makes this totally totally apparent that as as Christian was walking up the hill this huge load that he was carrying on his back is suddenly cut away because he reached Calvary Hill and his burden is released and he has life he can walk and constantly through John's gospel John records that Jesus came to save the world and for those that believe eternal life is the gift the end of this physical life sees the Christian to cross the river of death to reach the celestial city, the city that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for every person who believes. 
And the promise that Jesus declared to the disciples in the upper room was that he would return to take us to be with him. And this is a promise that Jesus Christ keeps. It is a promise that is sealed with the blood of Jesus on the cross and is proven to be true through the resurrection of Christ. In our times of trouble, live with the celestial city in sight. Love because Christ showed us how to love and travel with the destination in sight. And to all people of faith, to all people of faith in Christ, and particularly this day on Mother's Day, our destination is the celestial city of God, also called heaven. As each of us travel through, the, through life as a Christian, it is important to provide comfort and assurance in times of trouble and then point to the one who brings comfort to us. Now, it's, it's, it's okay to bring comfort to people, but point to the one who brings comfort to you <coughs> in your times of trouble. Point to Christ. We come to Christ, for Christ is the God of all comfort. And we can approach the throne of grace at any time with great confidence. For Jesus Christ is our great high priest who prays for you and your children in all times and in particular in times of trouble. We can approach with confidence for Jesus has given us the model for us to follow. Amen.